All right. Hello, friends. Welcome to Code Mentor Office Hours. Um, today we're going to be talking about Docker. Uh, my name is Mark Plotkin, and I'll be uh, moderating the session. Um, really excited everyone uh, is logged in here today, and uh, we're really excited that we have Andrew Baker as our guest. So um, just in terms of format today, uh, I'll do a short introduction for Andrew, and then he's going to really give us a nice lengthy introduction on Docker, and then either via uh, group chat or there is a Q&A app if some of you have that installed. Feel free to add your questions in as we go, and at the end, uh, Andrew will hit as many as we can. Um, Audio is working fine. Oh, okay, all right. One person's having some audio trouble. But anyway, introducing Andrew. Um, so Andrew T. Baker is a software developer based in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2014, he produced O'Reilly Media's first Docker offering, uh, an introduction to Docker, which was a video tutorial. Um, Andrew has presented at meetups, companies, and conferences demystifying Docker for developers and sysadmins alike. Um, Andrew has worked as a full-stack Python developer for most of his career. Uh, he took a break last fall, though, to pursue his own interests. Uh, since then, he spent most of his time working with Node.js, AngularJS, and the Ionic framework. Um, Andrew blogs over at andrewtorkbaker.com and is on Twitter at andrewtorkbaker, uh, and he's spreading software development love all the time. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I want to pass the mic over to him and uh, excited to learn more about Docker today. Okay, cool. Uh, so thank you, Mark. Uh, really appreciate the introduction. Uh, really excited to be here with Code Mentor doing these office hours. Um, so I do have a presentation, and we'll go through that, but I'm really interested in hearing your questions. Um, and if anybody has, uh, you know, a little bit of experience with Docker already and there's some way I can help you along, um, I'm really eager to do so. Uh, so I will go ahead and get the screen share started. And do you guys see the slides now? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so... In, uh, this is Introduction to Docker. Um, first, a little bit about me. Uh, like Mark said, um, you can find me on my blog or on Twitter. Uh, my Docker Hub username is AT Baker. if you want to go and look at some of the Docker images that I've created out there already. Um, last fall, I put out the Introduction to Docker video with O'Reilly, uh, which is a really great way to get a sort of jump start on Docker. It's um, just a little under two hours, and if you have... Uh, if your organization subscribes to O'Reilly Safari service, I'm pretty sure it's on there now, too. Um, so if you're looking for a quick way to really get into Docker and sort of get your hands dirty, uh, I think it's a great place to start. Um, so in this presentation today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what is Docker exactly, uh, trying to get a definition around it. We're going to talk about some Docker-specific vocabulary, some sort of key concepts in the world of Docker. Uh, I sent you one link uh, for and Docker for <laughs> integration. I saw. I haven't had a chance okay. to look at it yet. Uh, uh, sorry. Could think, uh, everybody else mute, please? Uh, hey, if everyone are, else joining, they're, could... they're, right now they are integrating with that for the continuous deployment. So they have one training session today. Uh, On code mentor officers, something like that. Hey, if you wouldn't mind muting, and then uh, Andrew will just continue. Okay, uh, so we'll carry on. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about. Docker's past, present, and future. Uh, I think it has a really interesting story as an open source project, and uh, there's much uh, that happened last year for Docker, um, including its 1.0 release, and it looks like 2015 is also going to be very exciting. So we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about um, the reason why I am really passionate about Docker, because I think it's going to impact how we use cloud computing. And then, of course, we'll take care of your questions. So jumping right into it, um, a lot of people have trouble trying to understand um, what kind of tool Docker is exactly. And uh, when I talk to people who are just hearing about Docker, they try to put it in um, sort of an existing category of technology. So some people think it might be like a virtualization tool, like um, VMware or VirtualBox. 
Some people think maybe it's uh, like a VM manager um, helping you manage a lot of virtual machines, like Vagrant. Some people think it might be like a configuration management tool, like Chef or Ansible or Puppet, if you've heard of those. Um, and then there are other words that kind of float around the Docker ecosystem, like um, C groups or LXC or Libvirt or even Go. Um, and when I'm explaining Docker to um, someone who's new to Docker, I kind of try to tell them that Docker is sort of in a category unto itself. It's not really like any of these existing tools. And if you go to docker.com, uh, their official definition is that Docker is an open platform for developers and sysadmins to build, ship, and run distributed applications. Um, and just looking at that one sentence, it's also kind of hard to tell what Docker is. Uh, so when I am explaining it to someone new, I usually try to boil it down to Docker is just a new and different way to run and deploy software applications. Um, when you start using Docker, there are sort of two two big pieces to Docker. Uh, there's the Docker engine, which is the software, the Docker binary that's running on your local machine um, and also on your servers. That's what's actually doing uh, the work to run your software. And then there's the Docker Hub, which is a website and a cloud service that makes it easy for everyone to share their, um, their Docker images with each other. Uh, so when I am trying to explain Docker to someone new, I generally like to put Docker on a spectrum here. Uh, so this is a spectrum of um, what it takes to deploy your software to a server. Uh, so you've been working on something on a local development machine, and now you're trying to get it out into the world, whether it's on a cloud provider or on a bare metal server you know, in your organization's basement. Um, so all the way on the left is the less portable but minimal overhead side of the spectrum. And so the first entry on this side is manual configuration. This is um, if you started up a new EC2 instance on Amazon Web Services and you SSH'd into it and you ran all the individual commands that you needed to run to install the right packages uh, to run your software application and then you somehow copied your source code onto that server and you fired it up and you know installed the right services and all that kind of stuff. So with manual configuration you have a sort of you might have a script of commands that you run and when you're done that server is configured exactly the way you want but it's very very difficult to then take that same configuration to a new server. You would have to start up the new server, start an SSH session, and run all those commands again in sequence, just like you did for the first one. So it's not very portable, but you didn't have to do any extra work to configure that one server beyond the work of configuring the server itself. A little bit further to the right on the spectrum are configuration management tools. So um, of the past few years, this has kind of been the preferred way to configure a server. These are things like Puppet or Chef or Ansible. So you have your software application, and then you also write some additional code, uh, some additional configuration using one of these configuration management tools. Uh, so you would have an Ansible playbook or a, you know, a puppet file. Um, and by writing additional code telling these tools how to configure a server, it makes your software application a little bit more portable. Because when you start up a new server, you don't have to manually SSH into it and run. remember to run all the right commands. Instead, you can just tell Ansible or Puppet to go ahead and configure the application um, exactly the way you've specified. It still takes time for all those commands to run on a new server, um, but at least you don't have to do it, all, do it all yourself manually. Jumping all the way to the right-hand side of the spectrum is the most portable way to deploy software, but it also has lots of overhead. And this is where traditional virtual machines come in. Uh, lots of organizations today, if they're running on Amazon Web Services, will um, use an Amazon machine image to deploy their server um, to the cloud. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Are, are you sure? I, I'm sorry, is there any way you could... I, <clears throat> Andrew, are you still there? Yeah, sorry guys, uh, there seems to be some confusion about the space that I'm in, so I'm going to have to migrate to another space, uh, but I'll be back in one minute. Okay, <laughs> really all right, no problem. 
in the meantime, if anyone wants to um, throw some questions into the chat, I'll, I'll start keeping track of those, and, and we'll make sure that Andrew hits all those when he... When he's... Yeah, really good question, uh, Lois. Um, we'll definitely make sure we hit that. Yep. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. Sorry about that. The joys of using a co-working space. <laughs> um, so traditional virtual machines, a lot of organizations will use um, Amazon machine images to deploy their software to the cloud. Uh, and those. this is a great way to ensure that the software that you configure in your build pipeline or on your development machine uh, will behave exactly the way you expect it to in production. Um, but these Amazon machine images are full export of a virtual appliance. Uh, they're really, really big. Uh, they take a long time to build, and they take a long time to move around. So I like to think of Docker as sort of occupying a sweet spot on this spectrum, where you get most of the benefits of traditional virtual machines, uh, most of the isolation that a traditional virtual machine gives you, but at a fraction of the computing power. And the way that Docker does this is, um, is what we'll talk about next. So if you've been on docker.com and looked at the About Docker section, you've probably seen a diagram similar to this one. Uh, this is a diagram of how a traditional virtual machine uh, set up for running software applications uh, is configured. So starting at the bottom, we have the actual hardware that's running the server. Then you have a host operating system and then that second gray box there is the hypervisor. So that's the, uh, that's the layer of your stack that's actually doing the virtualization. And um, the hypervisor is taking computing resources from the host operating system and using them to create sort of fake virtual hardware that is then consumed by these guest operating systems. Um, and once you have the guest operating system installed, you can actually install your software application and binaries and libraries that support it. Uh, so virtual machines are great for providing complete isolation from the host operating system. You know that if something goes wrong in your application or your guest operating system up here, that it won't impact the host operating system or screw up uh, some of these other guest operating systems. Um, but it also comes at great cost because the ultimately the server that's running this stack uh, has to pay computing resources to do the virtualization. So with Docker, it's a little bit of a thinner, thinner stack. We still have the server hardware at the bottom and the host operating system, but instead of the virtualization, the hypervisor layer, we have the Docker engine. Um, and your binaries and libraries and applications run directly on top of Docker in containers. Basically, the Docker engine, uh, when I'm explaining it to someone new, I, I say that the Docker engine is smart enough to use components of the host operating system to provide what looks like a guest operating system to your applications, but without having to actually duplicate all the effort to do so. So this is a diagram of what a typical uh, Docker implementation would look like. The sort of rule of thumb in the Docker world is to have one Docker container running on your server for each process um, in your stack. And that's not a hard rule, but it's a good one for people who are just starting out. So uh, my background is mostly with the Python world. So if this was a stack that I was deploying on a server, uh, maybe this first red box would be a container that's running Nginx for a um, reverse proxy and load balancer for me. 
And then these green boxes here, there's a couple of them. Uh, that would be my web application server. So that could be something like Green Unicorn. And then this blue box all the way at the back would be um, a Postgres server or maybe a MySQL server, um, you know, some sort of database. So the Docker engine is what's sort of providing the virtual environments for each of these, uh, but without having to take all the computing resources to duplicate uh, virtual hardware and a guest operating system. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some Docker vocabulary. Uh, we already mentioned containers a little bit. In the Docker world, containers are what your applications run in, whether it's running locally on your development machine or it's running in your server in the cloud. A, um, a container is how you run your software in Docker. And uh, you can read up all about on the Docker website, of course, uh, but the basic way that you start a container in Docker is with the Docker run command. So in this sample command here, I am using Docker run. I am running the Docker image busybox, and we'll talk about Im images in a second. And I'm feeding it the command echo hello world. And when Docker receives this command, it starts a new container uh, based on that image, feeds it that command, and then does the work necessary to execute that command. In this case, it just returns hello world to our command line. So images are just saved states of containers. Uh, this output here is from the docker history command and it shows you every command that was used to make uh, each layer in a docker image. And so you can see uh, this first one was an apt get clean command. Uh, then there was some chown commands. Um, we were making some directories. Here I'm sort of configuring a green unicorn server, um, copying over a Django admin, uh, Django admin file. <clears throat> and installing virtual env. Uh, images are sort of the way that you, you save the state of a container so that you can take it someplace else. Another key concept in Docker is this, uh, the idea of Docker files, or you might sometimes hear it referred to as the Docker builder. Um, Docker files are just a series of commands to build an image very quickly. Uh, and they usually start off from a base image, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Um, but Docker files are sort of your replacement for what would be a Puppet file or maybe an Ansible uh, playbook to run different commands to configure a server to have all the services and processes that you need. Um, instead, with Docker, you sort of bake those into your container using this Docker file format, which is almost as easy as writing a shell script. Uh, it, it really keeps things simple, which is one of the reasons I like Docker a lot. So if you go through the official Docker tutorial, or if you check out my video, um, you'll get a lot more hands-on experience with all these, all these concepts, so don't worry if they don't make total sense to you right now. But one comparison I like to draw for people new to Docker is that Docker is kind of a lot like Git, uh, or Subversion, or any sort of version control um, software. So those version control softwares help you um, sort of run and deploy and, and safe states of your source code, and Docker is sort of doing the same sort of thing, but for your infrastructure, for your, for your server code, um, for your server states. So in the Docker world, an image is kind of like a commit in Git. It's just a saved state. Um, in Git, it's a commit is a saved state of your source code, and in Docker, an image is a saved state of a container, a server environment. Um, you use containers in Docker for local execution, whether it's on your development machine or on the server, whereas in Git you would use a checkout or uh, maybe a clone. Um, with Docker, a repository means just the same as it does in Git. It's just a collection of commits, uh, a collection of images. And the Docker Hub is kind of like GitHub in that the Docker Hub is a very popular remote server where lots of people uh, like to store and share their Docker images so that it's easy for other people to see them and get to them. Um, but it's not the only one. Uh, it's just sort of the one that lots of people like to use. And in fact, the code that runs the Docker Hub, uh, the code that runs sort of the, the bones of the Docker Hub is also an open source project that you can use to stand up your own service. So let's talk a little bit about the story of Docker uh, because I think it's, it's a really, really cool story. Docker was first revealed as a dot .cloud side project in, at PyCon 2013. Um, dot .cloud was uh, 
sort of a platform as a service provider, and people would often compare them to Heroku. Um, and I think this is really, really cool that um, you know their platform as a service business wasn't really taking off. Uh, there was an article about Docker in the New York Times last week where they interview um, Docker CEO, and um, he talks about how when the company was still called DotCloud and right before they revealed Docker, uh, it was a really stressful time for him because he wasn't sure that DotCloud was going to be able to survive. Um, so instead of trying to double down on his platform as a service business, um, DotCloud instead decided to sort of open source um, this kind of open source Docker, which was sort of the secret sauce uh, for these platform as a service companies. Uh, container technology, you know, not necessarily Docker, but container technology is what allowed these platform as a service companies to run so many different software applications, um, you know, in, in a smaller amount of computing space and do so efficiently. And DocCloud just decided to take sort of that part of their business and give it to the world for free. Um, and it's clearly worked out really well for them, which I, I just think is so cool. So since then, Docker has really taken off. Um, Lots of Dockerized applications in the Docker Hub, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about soon. Um, and in 2014, uh, I think, uh, DocCloud changed its name to Docker officially, and Docker also released its 1.0 sort of production-ready version in June. Um, so Docker has been sort of officially production-ready for a while, but there were some releases this fall that really rounded out some rough edges, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this is a really cool slide. Uh, this was from the last year's DockerCon US, um, and it just shows all of the different organizations and companies that have sort of partnered up with Docker uh, since Docker kind of hit it big. Um, and this is really, really cool because it means that lots of components of your existing stack probably already have Docker support or they're working on it really hard right now. So it makes it a little easier to think about bringing Docker into your own organization when your build process, your, um, you know, maybe your configuration management tools that you're using probably already have Docker support. Um, so you don't have to build a whole new stack from scratch. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can just start integrating Docker with the stack you already have. This is uh, another really cool slide, and I'll make sure that these slides are available to everyone um, in the office hours write-up so you can get a closer look at this. But this is the timeline of Docker meetup groups as they were founded around the world. Uh, all the way over here on the left side of the axis is 2013, and then it ends in about April 2014. Um, but you can just see it just skyrocketed. So San Francisco and New York and, and Boston um, were early here in the US, but um, Lots of cities have their own Docker meetup groups now, and I'm sure there are plenty more who aren't even on this list. So uh, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, know that there's probably a Docker meetup group near you where you can go and find other people who are excited about using Docker. So let's talk a little bit about what kinds of things people are using Docker for. Uh, one very popular open source project uh, that came out early with Docker was called Fig. Um, Fig is sort of a nice little utility that lets you, uh, Fig is a nice utility that makes it easier for you to run multiple Docker containers at once. Um, and it's, it's pretty lightweight, so that makes it a really good fit for development environments. Uh, if you go to Fig's website, you can see lots of great examples, but on this one I have in the screenshot here, uh, this is a Fig configuration file where they define a web service and a database service. Uh, the web service is the custom application code that um, you, know, you would be running in your web application. And the database service is a Postgres database. Um, so you've seen the little parenthetical down here, no more installing Postgres on your laptop. This is one of my favorite things about using Docker for development. Uh, it's because it makes it really easy for me to get, um, you know, if I need a Node.js uh, component of my stack or I need Postgres or I need MySQL um, or, you know, Nginx, any of those, um, I can get all of those running locally on my machine without actually having to install all of those natively, you know, on my MacBook or my Windows machine, um, which just makes it so much easier to replicate the full stack that you run in production on your development environment. Of course, uh, because the sort of secret sauce of Docker and containers was originally used to run platform as a service uh, companies, that was an obvious application for Docker as soon as it came out. 
So Doku was a big one. It's um, just written in Bash, and it gives you, like they say, a mini Heroku without a whole lot of effort. So Doku is a cool one to check out if you're looking for a really simple platform as a service. Uh, but there are two other projects, Flynn and Deus, that are a lot more mature um, for running really uh, serious large-scale platform as a services. Um, so I think this is one really cool application of Docker because I've been in organizations before where um, there's a large development team and maybe a large systems operations team and uh, the development team always wants to spin up new servers so that they can have a demo server to show to their, uh, you know, their other people within the organization, or maybe it's a client or a customer. Um, and managing all those demo servers and has always been sort of a challenge, and systems teams don't really like doing it because they know that the demo servers don't need to last forever. Um, if you're an organization that needs to do that a lot, maybe using one of these open source projects to set up your own internal platform as a service uh, could be a good way to solve that problem because it'll make it very easy for any of your developer, any of your developers, to just spin up a platform as a service whenever they need it. Continuous integration is another big area for Docker. Uh, traditionally, continuous integration services have used virtual machines to sort of create the isolation that you need to fully test uh, a software application. And containers let you do that um, without spending as much computing resources. So uh, your continuous integration and your build, serve, your build uh, pipelines can move more quickly. Uh, so Drone is a Docker-specific uh, continuous integration service, but all the big CI players have Docker integration now anyway, um, including Jenkins. So uh, it it will be easy to find a way to incorporate Docker into your build, uh, your build process. One area that I think uh, is really cool for using Docker is educational sandboxes. So DB Conservatory uh, is actually the site that I built when I was learning Docker um, because I would sometimes run internal courses at my company about um, helping people learn the basics of SQL and databases so that uh, developers who had been using object relational mappers for most of their careers would have a chance to kind of dig a little deeper and see how everything is working behind the scenes. And I wanted a service that would let me just spin up a database for someone to learn on really quickly, and they could use it as much as they want, um, and then it could disappear, and you know I wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, there was another open source project early on for Docker that was uh, helping people get um, application environments, uh, programming language environments, really easily. So if you were trying to learn Python or Node or Ruby and you didn't want to go through the hassle of installing it on your local development machine, uh, there's a Docker project out there that will help you do that. So this is one area that I think we're going to see more action in um, with Docker as it, as it kind of keeps permeating the industry. One reason that now is an especially good time to jump into Docker is because the tools are getting better too. Uh, so I talked about how Docker hit 1.0 in the middle of last year, but they had some nice minor releases in the fall that really rounded out some rough edges. Um, one of them was with Ubuntu Docker. So Ubuntu Docker is the way that you install Docker uh, on a Mac or Windows machine. Docker can only run natively in Linux. So if you need to use Docker on a Mac or a Windows machine, you need to sort of install a tiny virtual machine uh, to help you run Docker, a tiny Linux virtual machine to help you run Docker. Um, Boot to Docker added a key feature this fall that lets you share Docker volumes between the Boot to Docker virtual machine and your host. And all that means is that it makes it much easier for you to do local development with Docker on a Mac or a Windows machine uh, because you don't have to rebuild your Docker images after every code change. Your Docker containers can see the new code as soon as you change it. Um, and it really makes, it really uh, removed a big impediment for using Docker to develop quickly on Windows and Mac. <clears throat> Another big thing uh, that Docker came out with last year is the Docker library. The Docker library is a set of images for popular programming languages and other sort of server appliances that come pre-configured uh, sort of in a very Docker-friendly way and with everything uh, already installed for you. Um, so if you are trying to wire up your Python application to use Docker, you should use one of these Docker library images where they've already installed Python for you. 
Um, and they've provided some nice little hooks so that if, if your code has a requirements.txt file, they've already written the Docker instructions that will install those requirements in your Docker container, so you don't need to worry about that. And for especially for simple software applications, these Docker library images make it so, so easy to get started. Um, it's, it's awesome. And when you start building your own Docker images, um, you'll really appreciate it because uh, you don't have to figure out all the commands yourself for installing something like Nginx um, or Postgres or MySQL. Uh, all of those you know, programming languages and those sort of big server stack components um, have been Dockerized already for you. So all you need to do is type in your command line, you know, Docker pull uh, Postgres, and it will pull down that fully Dockerized uh, image for you. And even better, these images are kept up to date by Docker and the companies behind the, you know, the specifics of the image. Um, so you don't even have to worry about making sure that you're applying the like, security updates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, they really take care of everything for you. I think the Docker library was a, a huge win for Docker last year. If you are looking for a, a little more user-friendly insight into how your Docker containers are running once they're out in production, you can grab a GUI for it. So Shipyard is a big project for that. Um, it gives you nice little insights into how your containers are running on the server. And this is uh, hosting, Docker-specific container hosting, uh, is one reason why I think Docker is, is a really great thing to look at for your organization in 2015. Um, one cool thing about containers is that once you sort of package up your software application in a Docker container locally, um, you can have a high degree of confidence that that software application is going to behave the same no matter where you decide to actually deploy your container in the cloud. And this company, uh, Tutum, is making it easy to do just that. So with Tutum, you give them your Docker images. Uh, if your Docker images are part of the Docker Hub, it's even easier. And uh, you tell Tutum where you want to deploy your, uh, you know, your software application. And you, or rather, you tell Tutum how you want to deploy your software application. So you tell Tutum, I want to connect my database to my application server. I want to connect my cache service to my application server and, you know, to the load balancer and all that. But um, once you've configured it, Tutum makes it just exceptionally trivial to switch between cloud hosting providers. So um, I think right now they have um, Amazon Web Services and DigitalOcean and Microsoft Azure. And choosing which one you want to deploy to is as easy as making sure that your API keys for those services are in Tutum's uh, dashboard, and then just choosing you know how many servers you want to run on each on each service. Uh, it's it's really really cool how easy services like Tutum are making it to move your entire software stack between clouds. There's also a new breed of hosting uh, coming out from all the big cloud providers, which are specific to Docker containers. So Amazon has released its EC2 container service. Um, these container-specific hosting services make things one step easier for you deploying your Docker containers to the cloud because they sort of remove the burden of having to actually start an EC2 instance and install Docker on it and manage um, sort of this virtual machine that isn't really doing much besides running Docker for you. So using these container-specific hosting services, you just bundle up your application using Docker uh, however you want, and then you can drop it in one of these services, and you don't have to worry about installing Docker somewhere or making sure that the virtual machine that it runs on is locked down and secure. Um, it's, it's a really, really cool new way to deploy software applications. So the EC2 container service is in a preview right now, but I'm sure Amazon is working on getting it out there and production ready uh, as soon as possible. Google has a similar offering, which they're calling the Google Container Engine, uh, which is also an alpha, but I think anybody can try this right now. The Amazon one, I think you need an invite still. And uh, not to be left behind, uh, Microsoft Azure is pledging to add Docker support natively to its cloud. Right now, I think there's a plugin in Azure, which makes it easier to run a Linux virtual machine with Docker installed. Um, but Windows and Azure are trying to make it easy to run straight Linux containers on their platform, as well as um, sort of a new technology that they're working on, which they're calling a Windows Server container, which would be um, sort of a similar way to deploy Windows applications uh, as Docker is for Linux. So 
what's next for Docker? Uh, in 2014, it seemed like the big focuses for Docker, uh, the project and Docker, the company, were getting to 1.0 so that they can say it's production ready and take off the big warning signs on the documentation and establishing lots of partnerships throughout the industry to make it easy for you to incorporate Docker into your existing IT infrastructure. And like I mentioned before, uh, they did a great job sort of rounding out some rough edges with uh, some minor releases in the fall. Uh, things that I feel like they addressed a lot of things that would sometimes frustrate beginners, especially when they were just starting out to use, uh, just starting out with Docker. So if you tried Docker early on before the 1.0 release, or maybe even shortly after the 1.0 release, uh, I would recommend giving it another shot now because I think you'll find that it'll be a little easier to get um, to get acquainted with. So in 2015, it seems like Docker's big focus is make Docker easier to use. Uh, one thing that they need to focus on is popularizing best practices for scaling. I was at a Washington, I was presenting at Washington DC's uh, Docker meetup last week. DC is, is where I live. And um, the big question that everybody has is we need to see how people are using Docker, you know, at large scale for real businesses um, before we can take it to our corporation. So right now lots of startups and smaller organizations can say that they have Docker in production, but it, it's harder for larger organizations that already have lots of IT infrastructure uh, to figure out how they can make all of their business work uh, with Docker. So big companies are certainly working on it right now, and I think Docker needs to find a way to get those best practices out to the community as quickly as possible. One thing that Docker uh, sort of announced at its DockerCon EU conference this past fall uh, was the initiative of including more batteries. Uh, so making adding additional tools to the Docker ecosystem to make it easier to uh, take Docker from your local development machine and deploy it on a cloud uh, without having to write a whole bunch of your own deployment scripts. Um, but sort of the, the asterisk on it is a lot of their Docker's partners provide these those kinds of services right now. So um, Docker has pledged that they do not plan to cannibalize their own ecosystem. So kind of take that business away from their partners and, and use it themselves. But instead, Docker is just trying to provide the basics of all the tools that you need to use Docker for a complete sort of development workflow. Um, and if there's been one knock against Docker uh, since it was released, it's that um, people have some security concerns about Docker. Uh, I do not understand the low-level workings of the Linux kernel, so I can't really speak to them. Um, but unfortunately, when people discuss something like security as a risk for your open source tool, um, that's even if you know people don't really understand it, or, so even if the concerns are misunderstood, um, security is one of those things where people don't want to take any risks. Um, so I think that anything Docker can do to sort of address those security concerns and, and try to put them behind it uh, will, and even better, explain it to all of us so that we can understand what the risk is without having to really understand low-level Linux um, details. I, I think that would be really great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why I think that 2015 is going to be a great year for um, containers and you. The first thing is that there was a new player uh, in the mix. So on December 1st, CoreOS unveiled its uh, container runtime engine, which they're calling Rocket. Um, Rocket is still in a really early stage. Uh, it's, it's far away from a 1.0 release, but it's sort of positioning itself as an alternative container engine to Docker. Um, Specifically, it seems like Rocket is trying to position itself as a uh, very security-oriented alternative to Docker. Um, so I, I think what will ultimately happen in the end is we will have a nice, healthy container ecosystem where both of these projects, you know, have exist and have good followings, and people, most people, will probably encounter both in their career. Um, and you know, most of my professional experiences as a consultant, and I can easily see a scenario where. If I'm working for an especially security conscious organization, um, maybe I would recommend Rocket instead of Docker, depending on how Rocket's development shakes out. Um, but for now, if you are trying to use containers in production, uh, Docker is still the only game in town. Um, like I said earlier, one of the coolest things I think about containers is they give you the flexibility to move between different cloud computing stacks, uh, different hosting providers. 
So this chart is um, a chart that was included in an RBC capital markets report that came out uh, not long ago, and it marks, it charts out uh, average monthly cost per gigabyte of RAM across all the different big cloud computing providers. Um, so you can see AWS, Amazon Web Services, is all the way on the left here. Um, and here's Google and Azure uh, and VMware and Rackspace. And um, the left bar chart in each little segment here is the price per gigabyte RAM in October 2013. And the one all the way on the left is the price per gigabyte RAM in December 2014. And you can see that um, almost all of them had big price drops this past year. Uh, Amazon Web Services, I think, still has like 75% of the computing power uh, across this entire industry. But um, it's clear that we're starting to see more competition in the cloud computing services uh, industry. And I mean, it's really, really exciting to see that prices are dropping uh, so frequently and by such, such great amounts. So in October 2013 in Amazon Web Services, um, the cost per gigabyte RAM was $42, but by December it was $25, um, which is a huge difference. So switching clouds based on price, choosing the right cloud because it's the cheapest cloud for you is really cool. Um, but when you have containerized your software application, it also opens up other really, really cool ideas. Um, so besides price, you could switch for service outage. Um, I've been a consultant at organizations that are dependent on AWS, and when AWS has some sort of outage or um, you know, there's just some inconsistency in their ability to host your web application, uh, it really, really sucks because for the most part, all you can do is kind of bite your nails and wait till it's over. Um, if you have a fully containerized stack, and maybe you're using one of those services like Tutum, um, you can imagine a future where it's not that difficult for you to stand up just, not, perhaps even if not a complete replica of your stack, at least a minimum, uh, a minimal replica of your stack in a different cloud hosting service just until that outage is over um, to keep you know, your, your customers happy. You could also do it because um, you are looking for specific CPU network or input output performance. Uh, right now, the cloud computing providers make it easy to compare on uh, things like RAM and uh, you know storage space. You you know gigabyte for one is the same as a gigabyte for other, and we can price that out. Um, but things like actual computing power and network performance and I/O performance um, are often harder to measure across clouds, and they're often um, harder to get consistent measurements with because a lot of times they can depend on what people call noisy neighbors. Uh, you know, if you have a virtual application on an Amazon server and someone else has a virtual application on the same Amazon server, if they're having a busy sales day, then your website might see some performance hits because of it. Uh, so wouldn't it be cool if you could sort of establish little metrics for your stack, which say when my, you know, when my CPU intensive part of my stack just isn't getting the resources it needs in AWS, you know, just go and temporarily move it somewhere else. Um, and maybe, you know, this is like my crazy futurist uh, dream, but if the cloud computing industry really does start competing with each other and, and we see more serious competition, then um, there could even be, you know, special pricing tailored just for you. Maybe these cloud services um, will sort of keep, um, you know, they'll sort of have like a profile on the kind of usage that they see on um, their services when you are their customer and when they think that the you know particular situation on their server for you know like that week is good for you maybe they can give you a special offer to invite you to come on over um, so it, you know I don't know if that'll ever happen uh, but it's a really cool idea to think about what the flexibility of containers give you so um, I'm really excited to see what kinds of services and, and companies sort of crop up to help organizations do these kinds of um, these kinds of of options give these or give organizations these kinds of options uh, when they have the flexibility of software containers and that is all I had so we can go ahead and uh, switch it over to questions awesome thank you Andrew um, so I've been I've been collecting quite a few questions we're getting um, online and a bunch were emailed in so uh, I'm just gonna jump in with some and, and hopefully many of you that are still logged on uh, this will be representing you and, and feel free to keep uh, jumping in with more questions in the chat so uh, the first one it was 
at a broad level, you know, how high is the bar to get started with Docker? Um, what does it take as far as skills, and what are the considerations to go from just trying it out to really be in production? Sure, sure. So um, <clears throat> I, I think it's lower than most people think. Um, when I'm, I run a lot of like Docker workshops uh, where we're, we're teaching people how to use Docker for the first time, and the, so when people ask me if there's a prerequisite for those workshops, I usually say that the only prerequisite is, um, is that you have some familiarity with running and deploying software in production, um, because if you don't, then this whole concept of boxing up your software application in a container so that you can easily move it someplace else just doesn't really make sense. Um, but if you have that experience of running like some website in production ever, uh, then I think it, it's really easy for people to get excited about Docker because you can think about all those times where you've had some some code work on your development machine and then it blows up when you hit production and you have no idea why. Um, and with Docker, it makes it easier to have a consistent environment between your development and production. Um, so it, as, as far as like how much effort it takes to actually get started with Docker, um, I think it's, it, it's less than most people would expect. Um, in the two-hour tutorial that um, you know, the O'Reilly video has, we, um, we start all the way at like Docker Hello World, like you just installed Docker, let's pull down some containers and images and stuff. And we end with um, building a custom Docker file for a Python application and then deploying it to a DigitalOcean server um, and then doing a code change for that software application and deploying that code update and then doing an infrastructure change for that application and, and deploying that. Um, so, you know, we I guess we got all the way from there, from zero to there in a little bit under two hours. Um, so it would take you a little bit longer if you were working on your own, of course. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, I, I think it's... It's a lot easier to get started with Docker than it was a year ago, for sure. Awesome. Uh, another question we got in, um, someone saying, at my current job, DevOps takes care of our, our Docker needs. What's a common use case for a developer, as opposed to a sysadmin or DevOps, needing or wanting to use Docker? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, because I'm, I'm a developer. That's most of my background. So um, I sort of hinted at it in the presentation, but one of the reasons why I really love Docker is because it makes it so easy to create an environment on your um, on your local machine that really closely mirrors what's running in production. Um, you get the most benefit out of using Docker for local development um, if your production server is also using those same Docker containers when you do your deployments. But even if you're not, um, you know, I, I know like for most of my career when I was doing software development locally for a Python application, I would just be using like the Django development server or the Flask development server or something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe the caching wouldn't be wired up um, or, or something like that. And I wouldn't have Nginx or my reverse proxy running on my local machine. And with Docker, it makes it really, really easy, especially when you're using Fig, uh, mm -hmm. to get all of those components running on your local development machine. And it is so easy to, um, to, to get all that running. So for me, the key... The key benefit for using Docker for a developer is that you can get that sort of environment, a, a more faithful environment, I guess, uh, in your development situation that compared to your organization's production. Gotcha. Um, can you talk a little bit about running Docker on core OS? Yes. Uh, I actually haven't tried it myself, uh, so I, I can only talk a little bit about it. Um, but I can say that I've heard other people, uh, it seems to have worked out pretty well. And with, um, with Rocket, with CoreOS's, uh, you know, their Rocket announcement, they still made it clear that they plan to make CoreOS the best place to run Docker. Um, so you don't have, I wouldn't worry too much about, um, you know, Docker becoming harder to use on CoreOS if that's what your organization is using. That's right. A um, couple other ones we got in. Um, Someone was wondering why doesn't Docker why don't Docker containers save file system changes? Uh, if I run a container for a database, how will the database contents be saved across reboots? Yeah, so running databases, uh, Dockerized databases, is is something that people have had to think a lot about. Um, one sort of the best practice that people seem to be settling on is using uh, what people are calling a data container. Um, so 
when I run my Postgres database for um, you know for my websites, I normally have one Docker container uh, that is the Postgres um, that's actually running the Postgres database, and then I have another container that is just storing the data. It's not actually doing any of the database operations. Um, and so that way you kind of have this separate Docker container that is, is just your data that you can sort of control and move around more easily. Um, and the actual code and configuration of running your database are in this sort of separate container. Um, usually it's, they're built off of the same image, but um, the data container is what seems to give people the most flexibility for that right now. Um, but certainly I think when people try and do like multi-host and master-slave and, and that kind of stuff, um, I, I think we're still waiting for some best practices to shake out for containers and databases there. But if you Google, you know, Docker database data container, uh, you'll be able to find all the best stuff. Gotcha. Um, yeah, people keep uh, keep writing in with your questions if you have them. Uh, Jason just jumped in. Um, what build tools have you used um, and are shippable? Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to dig deep into a ton of them. Um, Fig is what I've been using for most of my builds, uh, just because I've been trying to keep it simple. Um, I, let's see. Yeah, I haven't really had a chance to integrate with a lot of them. Um, gotcha. but to, to, amend, been... to amend my question, he, he was actually referring specifically to Shippable, Shippable.com. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't had a chance to try it out myself, but I've heard good things. Cool. Um, are Docker containers securely isolated from the rest of the system? Um, there's some concern that they wouldn't be as secure as VMs from a couple people. Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of the, the million dollar question on that security concern that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the, I guess that I always phrase my wording very carefully when I'm trying to compare Docker and VMs, and I like to say that you know, Docker adds most, provides most of the isolation of a traditional virtual machine with a fraction of the computing cost. Um, and so the key word there being like most of the isolation of a traditional virtual machine, I think that um, even if Docker and Rocket can, um, you know, really like address the security concerns that are out there right now, uh, which like I said, I don't understand lin low level Linux stuff. So it's, it's hard for me to evaluate that, just how risky it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems to me like because of the fundamental difference in architecture between virtual machines and containers that if you have like a really, really, really security conscious application where you, you know, like your business would end if someone could break out um, of a container, then maybe you should not be using containers. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. Um, yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, chime in. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the other questions we got are sort of along the same theme, so I think you've covered them. Um, cool. um, but if if no one has any other questions, I'll definitely put in a couple uh, plugs here. Or actually, uh, so Marjorie was wondering, do you know? Uh, maybe the meetups would be a good place to check. But she's wondering about any upcoming workshops. Um, obviously, Codemender.io has some great experts. Um, but do you know of any other good resources? Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, I will be doing, if people are near Washington, D.C. or can get here, um, our Docker D.C. meetup, we're going to be doing a workshop in February. Uh, so that's just coming up in a few weeks where you just show up with your laptop and we're going to start, you know, like getting you installed and working you through some tutorials and stuff like that. Um, I'm also going to be giving a three-hour workshop at um, PyCon, the Python conference in Montreal this April. So if, if you're going to be there, you can, excuse me, you can sign up for my Docker tutorial there. Um, I think that Docker Inc. does some um, some Docker training sessions. Uh, so if you, like you are working at a larger company and you need like to ramp up your whole dev team on Docker, um, I, I think Docker it, the company may provide some services that help you with that. Um, gotcha. Do you and, have? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that uh, like I would also like to uh, you know. Now that the video is out and all that work is behind me, um, I really like running the Docker workshops. So if you have a city uh, that's hopefully not too far away from Washington, uh, like I would be totally cool to come up there, you know, one evening and, and run a workshop with you and your group. Gotcha. Do you have, uh, on your website do you have details about those upcoming events that people want to check them out? I don't, but that's a really great idea. Uh, <laughs> so if, for the Docker workshop that's happening. Um, 
in February here in DC, you can just Google like the Docker DC meetup group, um, and you'll see the event there. And then uh, with PyCon, it's on the official schedule now. So if, if you're looking at PyCon's website, you'll see that. But um, gotcha. yeah, I, I should I should figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, every, everyone, we should definitely uh, follow Andrew on Twitter, and he'll he'll be keeping us up to date with his events. And 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 Marjorie, you know, for wherever you are uh, in in the world, the Docker meetups, it looks like they're in almost every major city. So I would definitely yeah. check that out for more in person events. Um, yeah. One other question just came in. Um, I suppose I'm still confused by the notion of snapshot. Uh, the OS, snapshotting the OS. How does one do that without, well, making an image of the OS? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're getting at there, um, but uh, I, I guess, like, my general advice would be these, like, containers and images and Docker files, uh, they, it's, they're, like, kind of hard concepts to understand until you really dig in and try... Um, try using Docker yourself. Uh, so if you go through the official Docker tutorial on Docker's website, that'll definitely give you a taste of it. Um, and then there are lots of resources out there to help you kind of get your hands dirty. Um, like for me, when I was first starting to use Docker, it was really hard for me to understand like what really is the way I should be thinking about containers and images until I actually tried to do it myself with some of my own software. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think with that we'll we'll wrap up. Um, that answered the question he said. That was that was good. So, um, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in, and I really recommend checking out Andrew's uh, O'Reilly two-hour tutorial on this to really dig even deeper. Um, and again, also, if you're ever having trouble with one of your own applications, please come to CodeMentor.io. We have a bunch of really awesome uh, Docker specialists there. Um, if also, if you're interested in joining CodeMentor as an expert, a, a couple people mentioned that um, you can apply to become an expert on. On the site, so please just go to codementor.io and check that out. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for the time. And and we'll be uh, posting this up on YouTube, so you can always refer back to it. And uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll say good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, or wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Awesome. All right, thanks so much. <laughs>